Hey everyone, welcome to another Toxic Google event. I'm Matt Bon Jovi, and I'm excited to be joined today by Dr. Cassandra Coburn. Dr. Coburn is the editor-in-chief of the Lancet Healthy Longevity Journal, which focuses on healthy aging research. Cassandra has, amongst her many accomplishments, given talks on health all over the world and run multiple specialist commissions to address inequities in healthcare provision. She's here with us today to talk about her new book, Enough, How Your Food Choices Will Save the Planet. Enough leverages the latest scientific research to address the vital question, can we provide a growing population with a healthy diet from sustainable food systems? To answer this question, Cassandra draws on the recommendations of the groundbreaking Planetary Health Diet, which provides a globally relevant framework for how to eat in a way that is healthy for our bodies and healthy for our planet. Now, throughout the talk, you might have some great questions popping into your head, and when you do, please go ahead and add them to the YouTube chat on the right. We will have time in a bit for Cassandra to answer some of these, so be sure to get your questions in early. But first, Cassandra, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. It's lovely to be here. To start us off, can you give us sort of a framing of what the problems are as you see it in how we as a society are approaching food? Why does it seem that something needs to change? So um, there's a problem in how we approach food because we are... Um, decimating the planet to create food that's slowly killing us, which is pretty much a negative on both counts. So the way that we produce food is unsustainable. Um, and the majority of food that we do produce um, is driving the incidence of what we call non-communicable diseases, which is say diseases with no um, viral or bacterial uh, component, things like heart disease, stroke, cancer, diabetes, and so on. Um, and it seems like the incidence of these diseases is rising, specifically because of the food choices that we're making. That makes sense. And the food choices being kind of the pivotal issue here, you then leverage uh, what's called the planetary health diet. Can you explain what that is and how it came about? Absolutely. So the planetary health diet is a series of recommendations that came about um, with, through the collaboration um, of about 37 international health specialists, um, everyone from environmental specialists to nutritionists, um, doctors and so on. It was published in the Lancet Journal um, in early 2019, and it was a collaboration between the Lancet and the EAT Foundation, which is a non-profit organization uh, running in Sweden. And essentially what the Planetary Health Diet attempted to do or did was to sit down and say, okay, how can we have a diet that would be applicable to everyone in the world that would um, both be healthy for people, so it would, do, it, it would make recommendations that for food that would stop or decrease the incidence of these various non-communicable diseases, but be uh, feasible and sustainable to be produced such that we're not eating the food that we would grow and produce would, in a best case scenario, even regenerate, even reduce the harms that we're causing already. But, you know, at the, at the bare minimum, would not cause any more harms to the environment. Um, so this came this came about in 2019, and basically what they what they come up with they do this Herculean task, and I think we're going to talk a little bit more in a sec about what planetary boundaries are. But they they do this Herculean task where they try and go through all of the different ways in which food systems are potentially harming the planet, and try and figure out okay what adjustments to our diet do we need to do in order to counteract that, as well as taking into account what we need for for, for healthy diets for ourselves. Yeah, and. Can a full diet kind of be formed from balancing these uh, sort of climate risks with health risks, or are they ever kind of in contention? So that's that's an, that's a great question. Generally speaking, yes. So um, what we what the what the planetary health diet recommends is not that novel, <laughs> which is a terrible thing to say considering I've just written the whole book about it. <laughs> but essentially, the recommendations it's making are pretty standard. Um, it's not calling for anything that we haven't heard of. So the kind of the main recommendations of the planetary health diet are one, eat less meat. Two, eat more whole grain starches, uh, right? Less, less processed food generally, less, less sugar generally, more fruit and vegetables, um, le less fish that kind of comes under that kind of comes under the meat element. Um, and this is this is stuff that we all know, right? This is what our moms told us <laughs> when you were growing up. You not necessarily be eating, eating less meat, but like in terms of what's, what makes a healthy diet. We kind of all know that processed food is bad for us. Um, but what's really interesting is how this more healthy diet, so you know, and that would have you strip out a lot of the um the sort of Franken foods and stuff that people are, are freaking out about now. Um, 
how that itself is actually just inherently more sustainable for the planet as well to produce. Right. right. Um, and you talk about the planetary health diet being this sort of global, taking this global approach. Um, right. And there, there's, of course, a wide variety of, of humans in the world, including different body shapes and body compositions and different nutritional needs. Uh, so old traditional diets kind of focused on these really granular goals, often weight loss being one. But over time, science has, has moved in a direction where there's more of an understanding of the various nutritional needs and the separation between weight and health. Mm. How does the planetary health diet approach providing recommendations that are applicable to this sort of global variety of, of healthy bodies? Absolutely. It's really interesting, actually. So in medicine, we're moving much more from um, a kind of generalized prescribing to more like precision medicine. And so in a way, I think what you're talking about here is this idea of precision food or what, what, what we need for ourselves. But what I'd say is, although um, there's a huge variety of people in the world, there's also a huge variety of uh, cuisines and food cultures, you know, and the, and, and the planetary health diet in no way seeks to prescribe, um, you know, you must wake up and have porridge for breakfast, you must wake up and have oats, you know, <laughs> no rice for you, it's, it's you know, it's this all the way. it doesn't seek to do that. It breaks the foods down into by major food groups. So you've got uh, complex carbohydrates, different types of vegetables, um, specific types of protein, including red meat, white meat, fish, vegetable, and so on. And what it does is it um, recommends that you change the proportions of those uh, mac macronutrients in your diet. Um, and that the idea there is that pretty much all traditional cuisines and, and cultural foods around the world, you know, everything is made up of the same components, right? right. Um, so the idea is that we just kind of fine tune that. And what's interesting is actually a large number of traditional diets kind of fit in to what the planetary health diet recommends. It's more as we've started to eat like a more Western, more westernized and uh, particularly uh, processed diet that we, moved, that we moved away from that. In terms of your very good point about, is this applicable to everyone? So, okay, if you have a health condition like anemia, for example, where you don't have enough like, um, iron in your in your body um there is that question should i be eating less red meat is that going to cause a problem and that's and that's not something that i'm seeking to uh to answer in the book i think it's you know I, i'm very clear in the book that everyone needs to make you know if you've got a specific health condition don't just drop that and and blindly follow these recommendations they've got to be right for you but generally speaking um most people are the norm not the exception so in terms of the sheer number of calories that you need this, the, 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 uh, the planetary health diet really recommends how you distribute those calories, not um, in any way seeking to say you should be eating fewer calories. It's more about like increasing the nutritional bang for your buck rather than eating less. Does that make sense? That does make sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so that's kind of the sort of healthy for our bodies side of the, of the planetary health diet. But then there's also this side that's healthy for the planet. Uh, you mentioned it briefly a moment ago, but can you explain the framework that you use for thinking about kind of the climate impact, uh, these planetary boundaries is the term that you use? Yeah, so the planetary boundaries are really the thing that kind of informed how this diet came about. And it's it's a little bit complex, so bear with me, but it's yeah. it's kind of critical to understand it. Everything in our world is connected. And that sounds like a very like, you know, crystals happy type thing, but it's, it's absolutely solid scientific fact. Um, and... And we tend to forget it because we think we, we kind of think of ourselves in cities and doing our own thing. But really, we're all part of the same system. If you know the houses that we live in came from the earth that we that we exist on, everything's connected. So planetary boundaries. So climate change is one of the planetary boundaries, but there are actually nine. Um, and the planetary boundaries that affect um, that are affected by food production are um, what well, climate for one, uh, biogeochemical flow. So that is. Um, the amount of nutrients that we put into the ground through things like fertilizers, so it's mainly uh, phosphorus and nitrates, um, freshwater use, land system change, and biodiversity loss. Um, biogeochemical flow kind of counts as two because it's got the two different elements. Um, and all of these things together interact to create what, what scientists call a safe operating space for humanity. So let's take climate as an example because it's the, the best known, right? Climate, climate is weather patterns and weather systems. The way that we can affect climate is uh, by pumping out or, or hopefully capturing huge amounts of carbon and other greenhouse gases into the environment. At the moment, the degree to which we're pumping out um, greenhouse gases is causing climate change, which is having all of these knock-on effects because of the, you know, the world's getting warmer um, and we it's, it's sort of moving, uh, th this particular planetary boundary is kind of moving out of the safe operating space for us. 
each boundary has a series of set spaces that we can kind of we can play in before it starts to exceed that boundary and we don't really know what the consequence of that will be so the way i the way i like to think of it is um the way the world the world kind of comes together is kind of like a tapestry you've got all these interconnected threads and when you put them all together it forms a picture and that picture right now is just about okay for us to exist in but if you keep on changing you change the color just a little bit more a little bit more the picture changes the earth's going to be fine like it's going to it's going to carry on spinning that will be okay it's not saying that we're going to have catastrophe in that sense but the problem is that the safe operating space the, the area in which humanity is okay and we can continue to live without interruption or disaster that's dwindling so the way that food um interacts with these different uh these different planetary boundaries is really critical because if we can use our food systems to pull us back from the edges of these planetary boundaries then we have a hope of like pulling the whole system back so that's why it's important that because everything's connected we can't just by focusing on climate for example absolutely super important not taking away from the fact that we need to go green uh in energy generation and so on but we can't just address it as one thing we have to look at it as a holistic whole um to really make to really make the difference that we're going to need to 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 live <laughs> yeah that makes sense and and a lot of the book focuses basically on how our food production systems are impacting these various um planetary boundaries and the ways in which we can adjust them to uh pull us back from the brink in some of the areas where we're we're in danger is that is that correct Yeah, absolutely. So what I what I wanted to do was really so it's very difficult, right? We hear these abstract things like I say to you, you need to think about biogeochemical flow and you go, "Okay? <laughs> huh? What does that mean?" So what I really wanted to do um in the book is kind of take what the planetary health recommendations are and I I very artificially tie them to a planetary boundary. I'm like, "Here's what, you know, let's look at sugar, let's look at biogeochemical flow and talk people through kind of how they're linked." Because I feel like uh one of the issues we we've got at the moment is uh, aside from you know covid and everything <laughs> else we're um we all feel a bit helpless and a little bit hopeless um there's this onslaught of really draining uh negative information coming at us about how the world is going to hell in a handbasket and it's really dispiriting um for us to sit there and think it it will rather it's all too easy to see all of that and be like okay well what can i do and so what i wanted to to really show was by how making changes to our diet can really really affect like the big picture stuff if we it, the, the trick really is if we can all do it and that's and that's the challenge like you know just one person but i really feel like the, the the time is here and the movement is coming where we are beginning to understand just how much our individual choices affect other people and so hopefully if we can all act together we can really try and pull these things back um in concert Yeah, and I think the book does a really great job of tying in how our individual choices play into this. Um can you speak a little bit about about that about how our individual individual choices impact these um food production systems? Absolutely. So, um it's interesting you say that actually because one of the questions I get asked most often is um do we need governments to act? Kind of, you know, it's and it's that sort of semi uh defeatist policy where it's like, you know, what 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 good can I do? I'm just an individual. But the answer is if for example we could just okay so here so so this is far away from um what the what the planetary health diet recommends but scientists have shown that if everyone say in Europe and that's just the research that I found uh would to halve the amount of meat that they consume that would go a tremendous way towards reducing for example land use change so land use changes where um we take wilderness or other other parts of the world and convert it into something that's usable for humans um and frequently it's uh either grazing pasture for livestock or it's uh creating the food for livestock and so on um that just that change will 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 massively push back those boundaries to the point where it's back in a safe operating space um and that's just, that's in Europe so it's a it's a specific example but um but this is this is kind of the point these small actions are cumulative it's um it's like if you think about um the miracle of compound interest right you you know you put a pound away now and then you just wait these changes will accumulate over time it's about having those kind of con- making those conscious decisions again and again and gradually as i say oh i'm not going to have meat today but I'll, you know i'm not going to have meat tomorrow um and other people make the same things gradually the the consumption will come down 
You mentioned there that one of the areas that uh, our choices impact is land use in, mm. in our food production systems. Can you talk a bit about um, what the problem is there? Yeah, absolutely. So um, when we think of land use, when we think of land use, we tend to think of deforestation. So I'm going to go with that example, although there are lots of different, there are lots of different types, but um, that's where you have, so you have this area of wilderness. Um, and in the book, I focus on the example of the Cerrado, which is um, a huge savanna in South America. Um, it's, I think it's the size of Western Europe or something. It's, gar it's, it's really gargantuan. Um, so it's very close to the Amazon. Now, as we all know, lots of Amazon deforestation um, to provide a grazing area for livestock. So um, they came up with a moratorium, moratorium on that. Um, they said no more Amazon deforestation. We know it's bad, we know it's affecting um, you know, uh, the, the local area. So, you know, fine. And everyone went, absolutely, okay, that's cool. We're just gonna move straight to the Cerrado. So now what's happening is that is, the, that's, the, I mean, the amount, I've, I've got the number here actually. Yeah. It's, um, no, I don't, I thought I had a number there. Um, it's, I, it's, I, I can't remember quite how much it is per day that they're, uh, that they're, they're, they're deforesting, but it's an enormous amount. And what happens there is you get, um, it's a really quick and easy way for look for, for people who, need money and the, um, there's no judgment here. It's like on an individual basis, everyone does what they need to to survive. But you have um, basically a chain that's linked between two massive like uh, trucks and they drive through the Cerrado and they just fell all of the world, all of the wilderness, just takes it all out. And then what you do is you get cattle in to come in and graze all of it. Cattle is not there, that's not their cash crop. The cash crop is soybeans. So they get the cattle to come and graze it and lay it flat and then it's ready for soy production produce a huge amount of soy, which is then exported worldwide for cattle, for, uh, for cattle feed. Um, and the problem with this is you, 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 you mess up so many planetary boundaries at once, it's quite incredible. So first of all, you're, you're uh, knocking down all the, the native vegetation and generally speaking, burning it, because that's the quickest way, right, of flattening the earth. So that releases the carbon that's captured in that vegetation already. So you're so already a net carbon emitter. Then as you plow out the land, you take out the carbon that's in the ground as well. Plus you're removing all of the um, sort of green space and the forestry space there. And what that means is that when you have rainfall, you well, it, it affects rainfall in two different ways. You either have um, flooding because you've got no kind of greenery that can absorb the moisture. So then you just get this effect where the water just washes straight off the land, takes off the topsoil as well and into the rivers. And then it, you know the rivers get engorged and flood. Or you have the opposite, you have drought, um, where the green space has used to be um, a net emitter of, of, of water, net emitter of water, you know what I mean? Um, it was transposition, you know, so they, as they breathe, they would give out water into, into the air. Um, in, the, in Brazil, they call these the flying rivers because they move across um, the country and then they hit the mountain ranges and then they're deposited as rain. And actually Sao Paulo recently had a terrible series of droughts, which they think was due to the fact that so much of the Cerrado has been deforested, even though the two are not very close to each other. It's to do with the fact that um, it completely messes up all of the natural cycles. So this is the main issue with deforestation. And that's like a nice kind of microcosm picture of, um, of, of, of how all the boundaries interact together. And that's one of the reasons um, that eating less meat is supposed to, is, is basically better for the environment. Um, it's not, as some people talk, you know, some people talk about it as being, um, the amount of methane that cows give out, you know, cow farts and so on. Yeah. And that's a an consideration, but it's mainly the fact that we are um, kind of clearing the world in order to provide food and space for the amount of livestock that we consume. Um, and that's the major issue with meat, um, with the amount of meat that we're eating at the moment. Right. And so you were saying with that, that the end result of doing all of this is so that they can produce soybean. How does that then feed back into our eating of meat? So, so oh, sorry. So, soybean is used as the as a as a feed for the majority right, of livestock around the world. So, I think at the moment, I mean, I can't remember the exact numbers. Sorry, I have a terrible brain for numbers. Oh, I wish no. I had figures <laughs> uh, right at the moment at my fingertips. But um, uh, China is a huge net importer of soybeans. I, I mean, like, I can't remember right. the, the amount, but it's vast, and that's for um, pork farming, um, which right. is which is huge in China, um, and Europe as well is a net imp a net importer for again for livestock. Right. So by reducing the quantity of meat that we eat, we reduce the incentives for this production to happen. And then that precisely sort of knock on effects. Yeah. And part, and part of the issue is as well, like because it's very badly regulated, mm -hmm. um, 
so so what would actually be we we could actually triple the quantity of soybeans that we produce right now if it was done in a more sustainable way and that comes from reusing already degraded or brownfield sites but we're not doing that um because that would require there to be regulation oversight the correct incentives it's much cheaper for people to just go and decimate a, a new bit it's much easier rather than kind of putting some work into into rejigging the previous area so from a from a world perspective whereby we don't have regulatory mechanisms that extend globally which would be which would be great but let's assume those levers are not going to happen anytime soon the easiest thing is to remove as you say like the end the end incentive so and and hope the chain kind of follows back yeah yeah and i think we'll come back to sort of government roles in a bit but specifically on this example you you mentioned that a lot of the um uh area ended up being kind of targeted because the amazon was sort of off limits what how did that kind of come about then like what made the amazon so protective that's a, so that's a great question so there was this international moratorium on soy farming in the amazon whereby there was a lot of um because, because i think the amazon has got um a kind of special place in people's hearts and minds you know it's the world's largest forest it's very easy to visualize in the same way actually and this is such a horrible thing that um cuter animals are disproportionately <laughs> um uh, targeted by conservationists like it, it, it's nothing that anyone can help we just like things that we can visualize they're easier to grasp and especially if you've got like a cute fuzzy thing you're like oh it's got big eyes. Make sure it doesn't go extinct. Whereas, you know, when you have like a really ugly bug that no one's ever heard of and emits and emits like toxins, people aren't like, oh no, a protected breeding environment. That's and I mean, I'm obviously massively oversimplifying, sure. but with the Amazon, people could see the effects it was having. I mean, it's still going on uh, recently because of uh, political changes in Brazil. Mm -hmm. Actually, the soil moratorium, which before was really quite heavily enforced, is no longer being so. And there, um, when I was writing last summer actually there were terrible fires in the Amazon. Um, and it led to parts of the Amazon being for the first time ever net emitters of carbon rather than a net carbon sink, which is what the forest should be. So that's a, you know, that's a specific example in the Amazon, whereas the Cerrado and the Chaco, which is another area, it's kind of got less of a, a global stage presence, I would say. And that's why it's easier for people to kind of go, you know, enact those changes. Right. Right. Cerrado has not as good of a PR department as the- uh, Unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So then um, sticking with these um, kind of meat based issues, another problem that you discuss is the issue of animal density. Um, can you talk yeah. to us about that? So there's I mean, there are a couple of issues with animal density. First of all, first of all, in terms of like land changes, you know, the more the more animals that you have, like the more land you need and so on. But the biggest issue of animal density, and it's certainly on everyone's minds at the moment, is something called zoonoses. And that's what COVID is. Um, so a zoonosis is when you get something that arises in an animal population, so a virus, um, and it then makes a species jump into humans. So at the moment we think that, uh, I'm not actually sure what the current thinking is about uh, where COVID came from. Is it an aardvark? I, I can't remember. I but haven't it's, seen, yeah. I haven't seen, <laughs> it's but yeah. A few times. It's changed a few times, but, it's, but there's the consensus that it was, um, it came from uh, some, some kind of wild meat being sold, right. you know, in a, in a wet food market. Um, and we've got other examples of, of, of this happening. So they think bird flu came about from a, chi a, a I think, Chinese chicken farm, um, ch a chicken market rather, again, with live animals. So when you have a lot of animals together, you increase the risk of, um, you increase the risk of these diseases arising um, and, being, and being passed into the human population. And the, as we keep on changing land use, which is to say encroaching on wilderness, you know, right? Because before, if you've got a lot of wilderness and some and some animal has like some horrible virus that can make the species jump, but it never has the chance to, to meet a human, not a big problem. As we continually encroach into wilderness and start affecting, you know, those areas, we're, go we're gonna see examples of this happening more and more. So as you have factory farming, I mean, the other issue with factory farming, which is again to say density of animals, um, is antibiotic use. So antibiotics are given, this blew my mind when I discovered it, are given prophylactically to animals. So before they're, there's no disease, there's no nothing, there's no reason to give it to them. They're given to them beforehand because it increases muscle mass for reasons that we don't fully understand. Okay. So you have these animals getting re really big and strong, being fed these things that are killing bacteria in them that they don't need. But of course, then you have rise in antibiot uh, antibacterial um, antibiotic resistance, you have um, the chance for new things that have developed in the antibiotic resistant area to, to jump into other populations, be it other populations of animals, humans. Um, 
I mean, it's just great for it's just great for bacteria. Basically, it's not what we need. Yeah, yeah, and it's quite a frightening kind of outlook, I suppose, given how dramatically these things increase the with the density of animals. Say that again. I'm sorry. You, uh, you oh, I, say? yeah. So I was saying it, it's sorry. it's quite a frightening outlook given how much these. Uh, these issues increase as the density of animals increases. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And that's what we're, we're, what we're seeing is we're just seeing a huge number of, of uh, as, we, as we continue to increase our meat consumption, which is what's happening, by the way, you know, as a country like gets richer, they tend to start eating more meat. Um, and we use a frightening proportion of our land for livestock farming. I think it's, um, actually I do have this figure. This is yeah. one of the ones I wrote down. So 70%, 77% of all farmable land in, in the world, or 39% of all habitable land, so that's all land that, that's not covered, covered by ice, is used for livestock farming. So that's that's a massive, that's that's a ridiculous proportion of our of our land, and it's only increasing as we start eating more meat. Right. And you actually have a really good kind of anecdote in the book where you point out this thought where if aliens came and visited Earth, they might study us and then would very quickly conclude that we as a species are devoting all of our goal, all of our time to the singular goal of eating meat. Yeah. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? <laughs> yeah, so this, so it kind of came to me because I was just looking at all the statistics and I thought if you were to look at this dispassionately, right. you would think that that's the purpose of humans, like right. just based, you know, just based on what we do. So, you know, I, I already said about the proportion of land that we devote to it. What's even scarier is they did this unbelievably complicated study where they tried to figure out what the biomass was, so how much everything on Earth weighs. And they did it very thoroughly. They did like everything, including like bacteria, you know, <laughs> from bacteria to all through to elephants and so on. When they looked at land biomass, so this is not including fish or anything, this is just land animals, including birds, um, they found that, uh, what was it? 35% of all animal biomass on the planet is humans. So that's quite a lot for one species. 5% is wild animals and 60% is livestock. So we're essentially devoting an increasing amount of time and resources to increasing that proportion of biomass on Earth. And, you know, fundamentally, it's all for stuff that, yes, so there's this idea of whether or not we should be eating meat, right? Um, I don't, and I don't know if, now, if you want to talk about that later or, or, or here. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that uh, works. Yeah, so you know, there's this big question. So I'm not vegan, and I make it very clear in the book. Um, I'm I'm not vegetarian. I like eating meat. If I had my way, if I if I could eat with no with no thoughts about repercussions, I'd probably eat more meat than I do now. Um, even though I feel guilty about it because I also like animals, and I try not to put those two together in my head. But um, from from an, from an, a health perspective, um, we eat so much more meat than we need to. You know, it's it's definitely moved from being like a, a nice to have or a luxury item, you know, and meat is as a as a as a macronutrient, it's quite healthy for us. You know, there's no there's nothing intrinsically wrong with eating meat. Um, it's simply the quantity that we eat. And we eat it, I think, pretty much unthinkingly. We'll pick up like a oh well, I'll have like a bacon sandwich for breakfast. Oh, I'll have a chicken salad for lunch. Yeah, spaghetti bolognese for dinner. That's three portions of meat. Whereas it's very, very easy to kind of take those to, to, to just make very small swaps away from that. And that just decreases the quantity of meat that we eat. Um, so, you know, because also eating the amount of meat that we do now, the sheer quantity is having other repercussions for our health. Um, eating a greater amount of fatty meat has obvious uh, cardiovascular implications. One of the interesting things is that eating processed meat or red meat um, also seems to increase the risk of cancer. That's not to say it's the same, like it's not to draw an equivalence between like a bacon sandwich and being a lifelong smoker. That's not the case at all. Um, but it is, um, it does seem to increase it to some degree. Um, and we simply don't need it we, uh, to, to, to be healthy, to function. We could eat far less and be absolutely fine, even healthier. Yeah. Yeah. And you kind of touched on it here, but in your book, you make this point about not necessarily needing to go from where we are now to going to absolutely zero. Um, and you mentioned earlier about uh, people with anemia or, or these specific dietary restrictions. Can you touch a little bit on some of the sort of cultural aspects of, of a meat-based diet? Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. Yeah, we don't need to go to absolute zero. So the planetary health diet recommends um, that you have something like red meat, maybe a portion once every two weeks or so. Um, and you can have chicken or fish once a week. Um, you can have, you know, an egg, eggs, 
Uh, are in fact the only thing that I think I'm like struggling with. I, I would say that I'm not there yet on eggs because I tend to have eggs for breakfast at the weekends and I'm really struggling with that. And it tends to be like one egg every couple, every sort of 10 days or so. Um, I, but, but basically the idea is that we just eat more kind of vegetable protein. Um, so that comes, and that doesn't mean we all switch to tofu. That means that you eat more uh, legumes, you eat more nuts, you eat more seeds, um, and you just decrease the amount of that that we're getting from sort of animal-based uh, sources. In terms of cultural tradi traditions of eating meat, I would say that the majority of um, the world's traditional uh, cuisines don't involve as much meat as, as we currently as we currently perceive perceive them to. I mean, I think there's, um, and maybe I'm completely wrong, in, if I'm forgive me, but I think you know Inuits are the only culture that subsists primarily of um, of meat based. Uh, meat-based diet because there was this idea of hunting whales and having the blubber there and it's true you can and there are many people who are like ab, you know huge advocates of keto diets and paleo diets where you have very high uh, meat-based diet but that simply isn't sustainable as it currently stands for the rest of us um what i find quite interesting is the mediterranean diet which is this kind of uh, which has been commodified into like a like a mediterranean diet tm but really all it does is it just describes um the practices of people who eat um, in the sort of Mediterranean region. So that's sort of Greece, Italy, bits of Turkey and so on. And there they find that they have like a really high, um, a diet really high in uh, complex carbohydrates. So that's, you know, unrefined carbs, a um, lot of, lot of uh, vegetables, a lot of fruit, a lot of olive oil, fats, are, you know, vegetable-based fats seem to be actually great for our health, not, not in any way negative. Um, so things like olive oil, um, sunflower oil and so on. Um, and they also have... Uh, they, they eat quite a bit of fish and they eat not that much meat. Ditto Japan, um, very similar, um, more tofu products, more uh, soy-based products, let, but again, far less meat, almost, you know, basically no meat. And what's super interesting for me is, given that my, uh, you know, in kind of my, my other role in life is looking at longevity um, and, and healthy aging, is that these two areas, Japan and the Mediterranean area, are actually... Um, the places where they have the high, highest instance of something called blue zones. And this is where people routinely live to 100 or, or older. So it's, it's kind of like the, these traditional diets really seem to make a huge difference in terms of how we, uh, in terms of how we age healthily, um, which to me is, you know, if, if, if you want to look at it solely from a selfish perspective, is the best possible reason for yeah. moving towards <laughs> something like the planetary health diet, because it's like it does better for the world, but it also potentially saves you a lot of problems in terms of non-communicable diseases. Right. And then switching gears a little bit from animal-based proteins uh, to another area that you talk a bit about in the book are the issues with processed and ultra-processed foods. Can you start by giving us a breakdown of what those are? Absolutely. So um, there are different degrees of food processing. So, you know, you start with like an apple, completely unprocessed. Then um, you can have an apple cut into pieces and peeled. That's very slightly processed. And you move all the way from, from that into, I don't know, like, well, <laughs> I, I always feel bad, like, giving examples of foods when I'm talking about, like, a specific company. I'm like, well, you know, you should be eating that. But, you know, let's take, let's take everyone's favorite bugbear, like McDonald's, right? Um, and if you think about, if you, if, or, let's take chicken nuggets. So you can think about how you would, like, take some like a chicken fillet and make that into something that looks a little bit like nuggets. But I have no idea how you would get this the kind of consistency and the texture and so on and the crumb of that. Um, and this is kind of my rule of thumb. If you don't know how to cook it, you shouldn't be eating it. Um, or that's not to say that you should be able to reproduce it perfectly. But if you have no idea where you even start, then you shouldn't be eating it. Um, and that's actually true because many of the ways in which they, people create processed or ultra processed foods where, whereby ultra processed is like the most extreme form of processing is to use techniques that are simply not feasible or possible in a kitchen it's 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 moved from from cooking to to a factory based method of food production and generally speaking what they tend to do is they tend to put more sugar because sugar is a great preservative so it makes sense to put more sugar into 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 the foods they put in um uh, you know, sort of unhealthy, unhealthy fats, um, and they put in a lot of salt, um, and they also tend to remove any of the, um, the the sort of fiber which we need. We haven't talked about fiber so, so far in this chat, but fiber is something that I bang on about in the book all the time because it's like it's like that's like the magic ingredient from vegetables and fruit, and also all the unrefined carbohydrates. It's like the 
it's 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 one of the magic things that really seems to help in in non in non communicable diseases. So with these processed and ultra processed foods, you can well the problem is is you get um, a huge number of calories and you get some nutrients, but they're much emptier. And everyone's heard this thing, empty calories, right? But an empty calorie doesn't just have to be because I think when when I hear empty calories, I think oh okay that's cake. It's like it does doesn't do you it doesn't do you any good. But actually some super refined, so some ultra processed foods or processed foods include stuff like pizzas that we put in the oven, just the way that they're created with, with a huge amount of sugar in the dough, sugar in the tomato sauce and all the rest of it. it. What it means is you're getting a lot more calories, a lot more bang for your buck than you should do eating the equivalent non-processed version of that. They did a really interesting um, trial where they basically matched, it's such a, such a great concept, they matched the total amounts of calories and macronutrients, so um, you know, protein, carb, uh, uh, fiber, carbs, and so on. And they matched them equivalently between a processed and unprocessed diet. And they let people eat whatever they wanted, you know, and then they swapped them around. So each one was their own control. And they found that simply by dint of the processing, people ended up gaining weight because, because basically you eat more, you feel less full because fiber is the thing that makes us feel full. So um, they think that this degree of processing is one of the things that's really driving non-communicable disease incidents around the world, um, which is why we need to stop. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, at least from kind of a naive perspective, though, it seems like if you if you give someone an engineering challenge and say, make food that's super cheap and people will eat lots of it and you can transport it anywhere um, and it will last forever, the thing that you're going to do is you're going to produce processed foods. Uh, that's it. Yeah, I love that yeah. from an from, from an engineering challenge, but, but you know, I would I would I would uh, I would counter you there because um, the engineering challenge is presumably yeah. So you're you're fitting one one bit of the criteria, right? You're you're providing calories for people, but it's about providing nutrients as well. And I think that's I think that's kind of the issue that we tend to overlook um, when you think about processed foods. It's not really fit for purpose, and I think that um, that's what. And, and, and it's really contentious, right? Because you're not allowed to say that. It's, there's, there's this huge sense that, oh, what you know, you people who have uh, you know fewer resources, you here is like an amazing hot meal which is going to fill them up and give them protein and so on. And you know, and you're going to say, oh, you shouldn't eat that. You should go eat some rice and, and beans. And my answer is, yeah. And that sounds awful, and it sounds very patronizing. And I don't mean it like that. I just mean that from a health perspective, the rice and beans is a much better idea longer term than a burger and fries. Um, and I think that we need, you know, there's an insidious link there that we really need to try and break um, if we're gonna, if we're gonna, if we're gonna break the cycle. Yeah. And one thing that's kind of particularly pernicious about these processed foods is that, as we mentioned, they're really cheap, whereas yeah. eating fresh fruit and vegetables tends to not be. Um, yeah. And it's it's not necessarily something that you can easily make affordable. So then you end up in this situation where it's kind of ripe for inequality, where you have some people who can self-select and choose the, to a more expensive diet that's better and people who cannot. Yeah, absolutely. And and it's funny because this is the one area where I do I do really think that governments have an incentive to step up and act. Um, mm -hmm. Again, I'm you know, I'm going to make a purely e economical argument here. Um, prevent, you know, an ounce, an ounce of prevention is worth a ton of cure, right? So gov I really feel like the impetus needs to be um, on governments to step in and ensure that people are not penalized um, and that you need this idea that um, if fresh fruit and vegetables are so kind of great for human health, which they are, then surely they should be subsidized in the same way that healthcare systems, like, you know, you, ha you have subsidized healthcare systems. It, there needs to be that, you know, and, I, and when I say subsidized healthcare systems, I'm not just talking about the NHS in the UK. If you think about like Medicare in the States, for example, like people recognize the value of healthcare for populations. We need to recognize the value of good food for people as well. Uh, from an individual perspective, um, I've had people kind of try and make the argument like if no one can afford it, I shouldn't be doing it either because it's going to increase inequality, which is an interesting idea to me. Um, so the, the analogy that I think kind of makes the most sense here is green energy generation. So um, in the UK, at least, you can opt to have um, slightly higher tariffs and you have green energy generation. Um, so it will be generated by wind farms offshore or something or tidal power, something like that. And I haven't ever heard someone say, well, it's not affordable for everyone else. You shouldn't be doing it. Yes, the benefit isn't personally to you, but it's a general benefit. And the idea is if we switch to a more healthy diet, hopefully that will start countering some of the effects, generally speaking, that the food system has for the world. So in my mind, 
that's enough of an incentive um, to, for, yeah. for us to start making those changes. Yeah. yeah, and at least in that example, you do also then signal that there is a market for these potentially more expensive but healthier choices, um, which can lead to knock-on effects of, of reduced prices and things. Absolutely. Well, it's 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 that consumer demand thing, right? And that's kind. Of, honestly, that's that's perhaps my hope for the for the book. If enough people can get out and kind of read about it, and hopefully you're going to have a bit of a backlash, because <laughs> it's not like as I said at the beginning, none of this stuff is that new or that controversial. Okay. Um, but what you have is you just have governments not listening because there's so much lobbying going on. And I understand it. If you're a company with vested interests, you are going to lobby the government to continue those vested interests. I'm not here to shout at people or point fingers or point blame. But what governments have to do is they have to realize that it's a very short-term game that they're playing. And hopefully, if enough people start to know about this, this information and can start caring about it and start acting on it, then hopefully it will start to drive a, a pattern in consumer behavior, which then drives you know, big corporates to say, okay, and we're already seeing that in terms of reducing plastics, um, people talking more about recycling. It's a slow thing, but I think it is growing and gaining momentum. So we all need to continue to push that, met that message, I think. That makes sense. And looking a bit longer term, there's obviously the impacts that we can have from our individual choices that will adjust markets and adjust these food systems. But do you think that that's enough? And if not, where do you kind of see the future of our food systems going in terms of a, a technological standpoint? So there are a lot of really cool technologies which are hopefully which are aiming to answer some of the questions that I've kind of that I've raised, you know, these this thing raises. So one is vertical farming, and that the idea there is that's indoor farming. Um, in the best case scenario, it's a closed system, and that does a lot of great things. It stops um, loss of water. It reduces the use of pesticides. If it's in a city, which quite a lot of them are, it reduces something called the last mile problem, which is where um, the majority of pollution uh, from food transportation happens within, uh, I'm using the word pollution specifically, happens within the cities getting it from like the, the big, you know, container lorry coming in from the farms to individual supermarkets. So you can have like fresher produce. And I think in Germany, they're trialing in, in supermarket vertical farming. So the idea is you go pick your lettuce from a kind of big vertical bank of farms. It's not the answer, I don't think. I, I don't think it's like going to be the solution, but it's a solution for a specific problem. Um, ditto a lot of plant uh, plant based meat. I kind of I'm very I'm very skeptical about it because I love the idea. Um, in theory, my question is, what's the substrate? Is it going to is it more you know if we ended up just like growing tons of soy for our consumption rather than the animals' consumption, then we we we're no closer to it. Um, a and B. The problem is with uh, the amount of energy it takes to go from that into a, a meat like product. And C, one of my issues is it takes a lot of processing, and we have no idea what that does. Probably the same thing as all of the other processed food issues. There's, there's going to be problems there. So that's not to say I'm against the idea of technology. I think that there are a lot of cool technologies. Like one is um, inse is insect farming as fish food, because one of the major issues with fish is we tend to feed fish farms more fish. Where do we get that fish? Well, we get it from the ocean, <laughs> and we're back to square one. And there's some really cool research showing that that might be you know, insect protein might be a viable uh, alternative there. But I think, and I think it's going to be a combination of all of these things. But speaking from an individual perspective where we can't go off and start figuring out how to turn peas into sausages, um, the easiest and probably likely most effective, long-term, sustainable, in all senses of the word, sustainable in terms of our habits, sustainable in terms of cost, sustainable in terms of the planet, is to simply make the changes that the planetary health diet calls for, or at least start working towards those changes. So, uh, you know, I'm very, um, I, I tend to see things in grayscale rather than black and white, and I'm very much in, in favor of making whatever small changes you can, rather than going absolutely to nothing or nothing. You know, if everyone were to become, you know, if everyone who reads the book becomes, uh, you know, if 5% of the people who read the book become vegan, right. um, but no one else does anything, I probably will have failed. But if 95% of the people who read the book make small changes, that's going to have an incremental effect. And that's kind of what I'm hoping for. Um, so in answer to your question, is it enough? Um, it probably isn't, but it's definitely the best that we're going to get from an individual perspective, I think. Um. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Um, and you touched briefly on it here, uh, and someone actually in the audience, Mason, has a question on this. Um, so he asks, "Do you think that the buzz around cricket protein will hold up over time?" Oh, that's a that's a great question. I actually um, wrote an article about this 
um, and I interviewed a couple of people. It didn't, not all of that made it into the book. Um, no, is my, is my answer because there are a lot of problems with cricket protein. It depends first of all where it's farmed. So if it's farmed in the global south, then it's, it's better because that's got the right temperatures and the humidity and so on. But then you have the transport costs, right? Um, it depends very much in terms of what you're going to be using it for. I think the insect substrate, insect as a substrate for fish food, as we discussed, that has a future potentially. Um, but the other problem with it, with, with insect farming generally, is what, in, what the insects themselves eat. And where they and where they get it from. So I don't think it's the because like some people have, have said like this is it right? We use insects, we mash them up, and we turn them into a protein for us. Yeah, that's that would be great if that was true. But unfortunately, there are a whole lot of hidden problems. So I don't think uh, I don't think it's the answer. Yeah, um, and so sticking with some of the audience questions, yeah, uh, we have one from Emma which asks: uh, Foods come in and out of fashion. What would you say has consistently been seen as beneficial for us and the planet? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I guess she can't answer. I was going to say, I don't know if it's a specific food or a type of food. Um, God, it's so boring. The answer has to be vegetables, like fruit yeah. and vegetables of, of all descriptions. So I know people talk about like, oh, today's superfood is the avocado. Tomorrow it's the blueberry. I'm here to tell you that superfoods are absolute crap. Just <laughs> never listen. When, it's, when someone says that this is going to be the answer to something, it's definitely not. It's not like, you know, like quinoa, for example, is like everyone's like, yes, it's super high in protein. The, the trick really is just having a very balanced diet. The way I think of it is if you're eating colorfully, you are winning, right? That's that's the aim is to not eat just like a, a beige plate of food at all times. And I think that any, you know, and when you think of um, kind of kind of markets and stuff like that's what we think about, right? We think of like super colorful, lots of fruit and veg. And I think that's the way forward. And I definitely think that's um the most kind of sustainable thing for the future as well in terms of the planet. Yeah. And following on to that, Jeffrey has a question saying sometimes organic is better environmental moral option and sometimes non-organic is. What is the strategy for choosing at the supermarket without researching each fruit and vegetable separately? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And I love that thing about researching each individual fruit and vegetable separately because that's unfortunately what it often comes down to. And that's not a, that's not a strategy. So um, I... I don't eat organic um, because I just feel like it's not a long-term viable option. It's, you know, when we came, when we come back to this idea of um, kind of privileged eating, I would say organic is up there. That's not to say it's, um, oh, it's such a tricky kind of moral area. It's not to say it's morally bad. The problem with organic is you have a much higher amount of food wastage. Um, and pe like, don't get me wrong, pe pesticide overuse is, is, is a huge problem, but we need to find better, smarter pesticides or maybe invest in GM to try it. So that's something I talk about is you can use some um, genetic modification of crops to stop uh, pesticide spread. Because the thing about organic farming is it's simply not a sustainable solution for everyone on earth. So it's fine if you want to just have like a small proportion of people who kind of afford to pay, because the reason it's more expensive, you're paying that premium for the, the wasted food that's come as a result of animals, you know, of, of crop wastage, essentially. Um, and I would say that perhaps the better thing that you can do, rather than thinking about organic or non-organic, is just make the changes that I outline. So eat less meat and don't worry about organic. If you, you know, from, from a kind of feeling good about yourself, <laughs> moral perspective, that's perhaps the best way to go about it. We have another question from Priscilla who asks, what is your opinion on eating local? Oh yeah, I, I love this question because um, you're going to hate my answer. Um, I'm, I don't I don't care about eating local, um, and there there are a couple of reasons for that. First of all, um, the transport costs of food have been so overhyped. So I've got this is like my favorite figure. So six percent of all greenhouse gases that come from the food system are caused by food miles. So that includes like being shipped from you know all around the world in planes and so on. Fifty two percent of greenhouse gases. Um, emitted by the food production system come from growing food, uh, growing livestock. So that includes land use change, um, uh, the, the farming to create food for the for the animals um, and the animals themselves. And to my mind, there's kind of no comparison. So again, it's n I'm not saying that like getting food from your local, you know, your local area is bad. I'm not saying factory farms, you know, in the, in, in the, in the, you know, in Idaho or whatever, like Idaho, I know it's Idaho. I, I'm terrible yeah. at this, but you know, huge, you know, factory farms. That's not, I'm not saying like um, only shop that way, but it, it needs to have much less emphasis than it currently does. I think it's that problem with visualization. Again, we can see the idea of a polluting 
plain or boat coming to us from, say, Kenya, where they've grown the green beans. We think, oh, I must stop that. But actually, um, in terms of supply chain efficiency, the idea of that last food mile is much worse per, per item of food. So say you have like a little farmer's market, whatever, 20 miles down the road, um, but going there and back is super inefficient in your car because you're driving there. And so the amount of greenhouse gas that you exude to get one bean is really low. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I would I would definitely say, um, again, to kind of enact the, the most change through your food choices, a much better uh, approach is to consider more what you're eating rather than where it was grown. Right. And sticking with that, just a little mm -hmm. extra. So is yeah. there any benefit to, we've talked quite a bit about the the, the bad of large scale farming and, and increased mm -hmm. density. And is there, are there economies of scale that do factor in that are benefits of larger types of farming versus local farming? Oh, that's a really good question, actually. And it's not something, um, if, if I'm honest, I've, I've kind of considered that much. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it wasn't something that the uh, that the research touched on. I mean, there are, there are pluses and minuses, right? Because when you have large scale farming, one of the one of the huge issues, at least with livestock farming, is um, manure runoff, which causes eutrophication. So that's when you get like all of the nitrogens and phosphates that um, come. Sorry, well, yeah, all mainly it's it's both, but let's concentrate on nitrates for a moment. That the animals eat and then it's um, ex uh, excreted. And it just washes off into the into the waterways, and then that causes these huge algal blooms, which in turn uh, re massively reduce oxygen in the water, which cause large scale die off events of fish and so on. It's it's a terrible process. Um, fun fact: our use of fertilizer is the thing that is the most out of control in terms of uh, the planetary boundaries. We are well into the unknown zone. No idea what's going to happen there. Um, so yeah, sorry, <laughs> so, sorry, negative out of nowhere. No, no. But, um, but but just but just to kind of answer your point, I think so. There are there are sort of harms at scale. Um, maybe that's the answer. Really, there's like a harm in the large scale. But actually, you can have much smaller, kind of more sustainable um, livestock farming, such that you don't get this huge amount of runoff, and instead you can um, re, you know you can kind of repurp repurpose it. So it, it used to be that um, animals were farmed on a three field basis. So you would have um, animals eating in one field, one field was left fallow for, for, for things to regenerate and another was used for crops. And generally speaking, the fallow field had some kind of nitrogen fixing plant in it. So that's things like clover, legumes generally, they have um, uh, sort of little nodes on their roots that can keep the nitrogen in the soil because often the problem is about runoff. Um, and there's a lot of talk now about regenerative uh, livestock farming, which is kind of returning to that. So it might be that actually, rather than seeing economies of scale, we see the opposite. We see economies of small um, in terms of at least livestock farming. Um, I, I couldn't comment on other other types of farming because I, I don't. I know less research about that. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. So we have another question from Luke who asks, "What is your opinion on supplements and artificial meats and their role in sustainability?" Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Um, Supplements. <laughs> the thing about supplements is they, you know, I don't know if you've ever looked at the back of your vitamin packet, um, <laughs> but they, they tell you that, you know, it's your like, it's like 400% of your RDA and the RDA means recommended daily allowance. So it's already way in excess. Um, and there's a huge difference between the pill that you take and what your body can actually metabolize. Um, so we, we simply cannot absorb the vast majority of the things that we take in supplements. So some people in the industry kind of callously say, well, it's a way of having extremely expensive urine. Um, <laughs> now, I'm also being hypocritical because I take them because, you know, I live in a cold country and I worry about vitamin D. So I kind of take them on that basis. Um, so I, I think the answer in terms of supplements is it's, it's probably not going to make a huge amount of difference. It might make a small difference if you're genuinely deficient in some vitamin but again the cure really is eat widely eat varied foods um the only thing i'd say there is it's different is vitamin d because that's um you can't just get that from your uh, from your food you have to get that through sunlight and if you happen to live in the uk that's something that doesn't <laughs> exist so um in terms of artificial meats we we touched on this briefly and i think that my you know my jury's still out one of the things i think that's really interesting is lab grown meat um so forget um this idea of sort of using vegetable-based protein, there's all of these impossible, impossible meats and so on, which are actually grown in the lab, and are animal, um, you know, the animal cells, which they've managed to culture. 
And I don't think I can have an opinion on that because it's such a new technology. On the one hand, it sounds pretty cool. I'd love to, I'd love to try it and see what it's like. My issue is more, what are the, um, looking again holistically, what are the environmental costs in terms of energy use and, I don't know, plastic use and water use and so on? How much water does it take to create like an artificial sausage? Because I guarantee you it's going to be a lot. Ditto energy, you know, you're, you're, you're farming it, you're creating it in a lab which has all of its own energy constraints. And I think uh, one of the things we talk about, the, I talk about in the book is this idea of a life cycle analysis where you go and you kind of look at the, the total that inputs needed to create a steak or a bowl of whatever. And I think it will be important to do life cycle analysis on artificial meat to see whether or not that can be a viable long-term solution. And it might be that it's not now, but it is in the future. So I'm not discounting it. Um, but I think that's what we need to consider. Yeah. And sticking with that point that Luke was making about diets with supplements, there, there's also this trend. So you're recommending eating kind of a, a varied diet, but there's also a move in some spheres to let's be really targeted and basically have food that gets all of these really oh, yeah, like that a, we want. And, like Huel, uh, right? I, I've seen that. Right. Yeah, yeah. exactly. My, 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 friend, my friend got that. He said it was one of the he said it was one of the blandest things he's ever had this misfortune to taste. Again, yeah. I don't, I don't know. Um, I'm, I don't know. And it's this idea of a kind of um, this body. It's kind of body hacking, right? right. This idea that you can uh, perfectly figure out what your body needs and give it to it and no more. Mm -hmm. And I have no doubt for the most dedicated people who really have like the best technology, which can accurately track their energy um, ex expenditure. And if they genuinely know like their body fat composition and exactly how much they move, and stuff. Yeah, you can probably do it. Um, I think Huel is relatively harmless in terms of what it contains. I imagine, again, it's a vegetable-based protein, um, predominantly, hopefully has a lot of fiber in it, you know, those kind of things. Yeah, maybe it might be able to fulfill that. Um, we don't really have the data on it long term, so I couldn't comment on that basis. But what I would say is it really, to, for it to work, it will really rely on you knowing your exact needs. And I think it's very difficult for anyone to, to, to know that exactly. Um, I would say that probably the healthiest option still remains a very varied, very colorful, very veg and fruit, you know, and fruit rich diet. Sorry to sound like like a broken record. No, not at all. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I guess you also do miss out on kind of the fun of eating with these things where it's, if it's very targeted, just like a brown sludge, it's not. You know, some people, sort of, yeah. I mean, for, for some people, like some people just, really just want their food to, to, to kind of tick the box and be done with it. And, yeah. you know, I, if that's who you are, that's, that's totally cool. I, I come from a family and a culture which, which is just about eating and drinking. So for, for me, one of the things that's really critical is, uh, with, especially with this, was I didn't want anyone to feel like we can't have fun anymore. Like food has to be like something that we just, an obligation we fulfill rather than something we continue to enjoy. Um, and that's, sorry, I'm, I'm rambling, but I would say that that's why it's kind of fun to start looking at food cultures around the world. So um, my partner's Greek and, you know, the Mediterranean diet is great and the way that people eat in the Mediterranean is great. But looking much further afield than that, like I would say a lot of like Indian cuisines, like in Kerala, which is very fish based um, or a lot, you know, it's predominantly vegetarian. India is the one exception to the richer, the, the increase in um, GDP just has not led to an increase in meat consumption. It's, uh, you know, and there's, um, there's a religious aspect there as well. But, you know, my, my, my point being that you, it's totally possible to have like a really lovely plate of food every day, every meal. Um, it's delicious and fulfilling and healthy without, in, without impacting on the planet or diminishing your kind of enjoyment of it. So, yeah, I definitely think it's possible. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's an excellent point to end on, and we're just out of time now. So, okay. Sandra, I want to thank you again for joining us, and it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you today. Oh, it's been so great. Um, thank you so much for the invitation. I really appreciate it. Yes, yeah. So Dr. Coburn's book, Enough, uh, food, How Your Food Choices Will Save the Planet, is available now wherever books are sold. Um, I really do recommend it. For everyone who joined us, we look forward to seeing you at our next Toxic Google event. Please stay safe and take care. <laughs>